where we're going. Now, if you have any thoughts on any of the topics covered, be sure to share them right here in the live chat because we want to hear your take. Some of the high points have to include the mind-blowing developments regarding Presence Platform, WebXR, and so much more. Now, don't forget, there's even more info on all of these topics in our phenomenal sessions that are now unlocked and can be found right now via our Connect 2021 playlists, including Mari's Building an Accessible Future in VR session, which is such an important topic. Check that out along with many of our other sessions with just fantastic speakers and dive even deeper into all the topics you're excited about. Okay. Now it's time to take a time for the one and only John Carmack. How exciting is this going to be? He is the quintessential leader, CTO, everything that we're excited about. So let's go to him right now. Welcome to Connect, everyone. So my process for these talks is that I basically go back through the last year of internal posts and public tweets that I've made looking for things that are interesting and worthwhile to talk about. And then I try to roughly sort them into some kind of a coherent topic flow. And then usually one or two days before the show, I wind up kind of feeding those notes over to comms to make sure nobody is going to absolutely freak out about anything that I say. And normally there's just a little bit of uh, kind of gentle pushback on a couple of things. And only one time in the history of all the times that I've done this has anyone ever said, it's like, no, don't talk about this. And that was about uh, calling out SLAM or simultaneous localization and mapping before we had kind of Quest's insight tracking working, which was really a silly thing in retrospect. But so uh, I'm usually a bit of a counterpoint to the grand strategic visions because I'm all focused on the nuts and bolts of things. And I'm also usually the one that's a lot more kind of grumpy and unhappy with, uh, with the way things are going as I always want more and faster progress. But this year I really have a lot of things to be quite happy about. By far the most important is that Quest 2 has been a really big success. And it was, you know, it was a heroic effort to get it out when it was last year in the space of all the headwinds that we had but it was better, faster, cheaper. One of those just rare combinations that you almost never get to have in a product. And while there's still like a couple minor things where some people do still miss the, the OLED displays or the continuous IPD adjustment, it really was a fantastic product and the market has responded very positively to it. I mean, it would be a really big danger sign if we had been able to do all of that and we didn't have this integer multiple uptick that we saw with Quest 2 over Quest 1. But so that's a sign that things are looking good for that and the whole ecosystem has been benefiting and it's been a really good thing. But there's uh, a bunch of other things that I've often talked about in these past uh, Connect talks that I've been complaining about how we should really have this, why don't we have this yet? And a bunch of them did land this year. Uh, Airlink got released where we had Oculus Link out and it was doing better than people expected internally, lots of uptake for it. And we had the existence proof of virtual desktop streaming Steam games. And there was a lot of internal debate about this, about whether we needed to make completely custom hardware to be able to do wireless Wi-Fi. Uh, but we shipped it. It's great. Lots of people love it. Uh, it doesn't work for everybody. Not everyone has good enough Wi-Fi for it to be a good solution for them. But it does work for a lot of people. And it's kind of funny how we've got the obvious extensions to this where You've got AirLink to your own PC. There's a bunch of language right now where they're kind of carefully protecting certain use cases, but there's obvious things that we'd like to be able to, to offer, or I'd like to be able to offer, where you should be able to AirLink to your friend's PC. Uh, one small step from that to some kind of a cloud link where you could play VR games um, you know, on cloud servers. Uh, onto your mobile system potentially anywhere. Now, there's even more challenges for that. And there's always been this spectrum from obviously pure native is best, wired link has the next fewest problems, Wi-Fi has the next fewest problems, going all the way to cloud brings in a whole new set of issues. And we're gonna have the exact same arguments that we always have on every single one of these steps. It's not gonna be great for everybody. It cuts off more potential users, but there's gonna be a bunch of people that can find something like that valuable. And in fact, it's been almost funny how the conversation has changed so much that cloud VR rendering is now almost looked at as a plan of record for some of the metaverse options that we're looking at, where 
cloud rendering couldn't get the time of day a year ago, but now it's almost looked at as plan of record to the point that I'm even gently pushing back a little bit on it with like a, you know, whoa, hold up. There's still a lot of challenges with cloud rendering. There's a lot of negatives and other things that we need to factor into. Maybe we shouldn't jump right to that, but it's been great to see the progress and most importantly for me, the user value that we've delivered with that. App Lab got released, which has been uh, from the beginning this long tension between more open application development versus carefully curated spaces. And again, enormous internal battles about this over who's going to control access to the VR screen, uh, what we're going to allow in. And uh, we finally shipped it, and we've already got some really amusing data points that are happening, like Gorilla Tag having more concurrent multiplayer users than big budget titles that have had millions and millions of dollars poured into them. And I want to keep coming back to this sense of we should trust the market rather than sort of our internal content czars that want to pick and choose the winners with it. But there's still, while it's supposed to not be the full store review process, there's still a significant review process and we've been backed up for multiple months at times with this. And I do think that really needs to get solved in some way. And I've always suggested that we should be able to get to a reactive approach rather than a filtering approach. I mean, you couldn't run like a social media network if every post had to be approved. You obviously get to the point where you let everything go out and when something is problematic, then you go back in, you worry about taking it down. And I think we should be able to get there with App Lab as well, but that's not our current plan of record and that's just something that needs to be pushed on. And I certainly have some, I'm, sympathy for the review schedule where I had promised to do more kind of public app reviews and I'm not even done with my third one yet. It's just hard to kind of get through all of these things. So again, I'm pushing for more of a kind of open-ended approach there. Another thing that was really kind of a niche feature, but 120 frames per second support uh, landed this year. And that's been another kind of fun one with the internal arguments about it, where in previous years I had talked about how we had found out that the original Quest 1 hardware could actually run at 90 hertz, not just 72. And it would have been nice to be able to do that. The theory was that some applications could be lightweight enough to be able to run at that speed. And maybe it'd be great for Oculus Link support uh, to be able to run PC content at sort of its original CB1 native uh, rates. But uh, we never were able to get that one through. There was this idea that, well, changing the clock rate on that, we would have to get it FCC certified again, recertify the device. And that was never going to happen for a device at that point in its, in its kind of lifespan. But on Quest 2, there were no clock changes. It was just changes in kind of what goes into the timings to be able to do that. But we still ran into a ton of internal resistance about it from display teams about, well, it's not certified to do that. Um, you know, it might not always switch. It might have ghosting. And we had people going and say, well, let's go, walk, go into a walk-in refrigerator and try it in there in the worst case for an LCD screen. It's like, okay, maybe you can see a touch of ghosting, but it's just not that big of a deal. Um, people saying it's like, well, nobody will actually take advantage of this. 120 frames per second is too hard. Uh, but then it came down to some more arguments about, well, okay, maybe it works on our display now, but what if we want to second source something? What if we want to go ahead and uh, you know, use displays from another vendor where we've kind of said we want this 90 hertz, but maybe not everything can be pushed to 120. And there's, there's something to that argument where it's always better for hardware vendors uh, when you're making a piece of hardware to be able to have multiple sources for the components that you use. It's important in case something catastrophic happens to one of them, but it's also important to give you a little bit of leverage with the companies. If a company knows that they make the only part in the world that you can use, they've kind of got you over a barrel and it hurts your negotiating position for everything. But if there's at least two companies sourcing components, uh, you're in a much better position to be able to say, well, I'm just going to take the one that meets my minimums and um, you know, and is the cheapest at that point. And this winds up um, impacting us on a bunch of other things. Like we only found out kind of this year that we have a couple different SKUs of flash vendors and they have slightly different performance characteristics. It's not anything that you would notice. They all met the specs that we listed, but some of them are a little bit better than the specs that we had. And if you write really hardcore IO tests, you can tell the difference between some versions of Quest. But uh, we did finally get it out, and it was literally over a year from the point where it was demonstrated that 120 hertz works to the time that we could actually ship it. And I found that ludicrous that it took that long. It was just not much code at all. 
uh, but it's out there and it's a success story. And that's one of the poster childs that I get to use internally now about how sometimes our process messes things up. And we do have applications uh, that are taking advantage of it. Like one of the first ones that was a cheerleader for this was 11 Table Tennis, you know, the ping pong simulator game, where that sort of super fast reactions and twitches on that are super important. And it was simple enough that they could cut down the scenes as much as necessary to get to a stable frame rate there. And interestingly, that game also pointed out some of the issues with the extrapolation of our controllers, where they, uh, you know, they see certain problems with even only extrapolating 30 milliseconds into the future that serious players can actually tell the difference. So we've still got room to grow at the high end for our responsiveness in VR for some applications. And then uh, one of the ones that's very near and dear to my heart is just this last week, we were able to release the unlocked Oculus Go uh, system software release. And this has been far longer in the making than, uh, than you're likely to, to consider because even before Oculus Go existed, when we were planning to ship our first standalone headset, there were serious discussions internally about, well, can we let users have root? And there's always been the breakdown between usually the people on the system software side and a lot of the engineers, like, yes, that would be a wonderful thing to offer users but people will wind up coming up with reasons about how well that might undermine some of our, you know, our platform integrity. Uh, it might have privacy compromise issues. It might have all, it's easy to come up with a big list of reasons why it's not a good idea. So Oculus Go went through its sales life, um, you know, and it's no longer on sale. And we've already reached the point where we've stopped accepting new applications to the, the store for it. So. I was able to make the pitch again. It's like, okay, we are going to discontinue this product in a finite amount of time. You know, basically the policy is that you get two years of support from the last time that it was on sale. Uh, so there's a clock ticking and at that point. Uh, no more support is guaranteed. I mean, it's not a guarantee that we'll shut it off immediately, but there's no more obligation to do so. So given that there's this very finite time coming up, um, let's talk again about how we're going to have this stuff, these hardware, you know, a lot of them. There's you know, well over a million Oculus Go's out there. And they, at some point, things stop working and they become sort of e-waste. This is a problem that people talk about a lot. And there's a clear thing that you can do with that. You can go ahead and let it be used for more things. And I'm... It's been looking back over just I made vague reference to vague references to this a couple times over the year, but there's been a semi serious effort going on for most of last year and it finally got through everything at the end to get the go ahead and surprisingly the resistance wasn't from where you'd expect. Uh, the legal team was supportive of this a lot earlier than I would have expected. Uh, they went out and they did a bunch more work than I thought was going to have to be necessary, talking with partners. We even had some partner contracts updated for this. And I, I wish I could give a shout out thanks to these, but apparently they didn't want to be explicitly named for this. But some of our partners that had no real need to do this did go out of their way and execute a new contract with us that allowed us to go through and do this. But we had more people internally on the product teams worrying about, oh, you know, hand wringing. What could this do? Could somebody be able to go in and in some way, like expose some security issue with our system software, uh, get at it in some way and just just issues. But eventually everything got settled down. We got to do it. And I'm real happy that it's out there. One of the scenarios that I've said that I always want to care about is I want somebody five years from now to find a dusty old shrink wrapped box in a closet, uh, take the shrimp shrink wrap off, uh, power something up and load the last operating system version onto it rather than whatever first was originally in the factory flash with no over the air updates available. But still, this is only step one, where the next step is going to be preserving the content ecosystem. I'm still trying to fight that battle internally to let us do something official and all-encompassing, but it's possible that may still need to fall to third parties, where everyone that's got to go, back up your software off of it, make sure that it lives somewhere. So if we do need to piece together the content repository years from now from you know, a thousand separate little hard drive images, we at least have the possibility to do that but I am hoping that we can do something better internally. Now, obviously the metaverse is the dominant topic of the day. 
And uh, I was quoted all the way back in the 90s as saying that building the metaverse is a moral imperative. And even back then, most people missed that I was actually making a movie reference, but I was still at least partially serious about that. Uh, I really do care about it, and I buy into the vision. But that leaves many people surprised to find out that I have been pretty actively arguing against every single metaverse effort that we have tried to spin up internally in the company from even pre-acquisition times. I, you know, I want it to exist, but I have pretty good reasons to believe that go, setting out to build the metaverse is not actually the best way to wind up with the metaverse. And uh, kind of my primary thinking about that is a line that I've been saying for years now uh, in general relation to my arguing against these efforts is that the metaverse is a honeypot trap for architecture astronauts. And uh, architecture astronaut is a kind of chidingly pejorative term for a class of programmers or designers that are that want to only look at things from the very highest levels, that don't want to talk about GPU microarchitectures or merging network streams, you know, or dealing with any of the architecture asset packing, any of the nuts and bolts details, but they just want to talk in high abstract terms about how, well, we'll have generic objects that can contain other objects that can have references to these and entitlements to that, and we can atomically pass control from one to the other. And I just want to tear my hair out at that because that's just so not the things that are actually important when you're building something. But, uh, you know, but here we are. Mark Zuckerberg has decided that now is the time to build the metaverse. So enormous wheels are turning and resources are flowing and the effort's definitely going to be made. So the, the big challenge now is to try to take all of this energy and make sure it goes to something positive and we're able to build something that has real near-term user value. Because my worry is that we could spend years and thousands of people possibly and wind up with things that didn't contribute all that much to the ways that people are actually using the devices and hardware today. So my biggest advice is that we need to concentrate on actual products rather than technology, architecture, or initiatives. Now, I didn't write game engines when I was working at id Software. I wrote games, and some of the technology that was in those games turned out to be reusable enough to be applied to other things, but it was always driven by the product itself, and the technology was what enabled the product and then almost accidentally enabled some other things after it. And it's hard for a lot of people to really accept how rarely future-proofing and planning for broad generalizations of things turns out to really deliver value. It is really shocking how often that winds up getting in your way, making it harder to do the things that you're trying to do today in the name of things you hope to do tomorrow, and that it's not actually there or doesn't actually work right when you get around to wanting to do that. So. Horizon Worlds is a product. You know, a product can be clearly judged. How many people are using it? You know, what are they doing in it? I am, how much commerce is going on in it? Uh, all those sorts of things. I am, Horizon Workrooms is a product. How do we compete against Zoom meetings? And I'm, I'm pretty excited about some of the prospects, some of the early signs that we're seeing with this, where I mean, everybody's in a lot of Zoom meetings, and sometimes when you're in workrooms or Horizon interacting with a producer, a TPM, a few other people, it winds up really actually being better than staring at the wall of faces in the, you know, on the Zoom screen. And I, I was also super excited where I heard people spontaneously commenting about how conversation in workrooms was better than what they were seeing in some of the other VR apps and also uh, a lot of the traditional video conferencing systems. And that was become, because workrooms had redone the audio stack so that their voice communication had a couple hundred milliseconds less latency than what you were seeing in Horizon or most other places. And uh, I've always cheer-led the fact that these things matter. You know, we can get a whole lot better. And even where we're at in workrooms is still far from sort of the, the speed of light of what we could be with this. But people noticed, and we can get twice as good as we are right there and get that much better. But it was interesting when I was kind of digging down into some of those latency issues. I, unfortunately, the speed of light, the minimum kind of loopback latency, has actually gotten worse from Oculus Go into Quest 2. 
Uh, when you kind of do this where you just make a loop back where you can play a chirp out of the speaker and see when it comes back into the microphone, uh, it's a little bit better with uh, when you don't have any processing going on, but when you've got echo cancellation and some of the other DSP processing that happens, it's it's really annoyingly high right now. It's over 100 milliseconds as the very minimum, even if you do kind of nothing wrong above that. Uh, so that's one of those things where, you know, I'm sort of hoping I can, I can harness all of this crisis energy with the metaverse going around. It's like, okay, we need to dig down into like the little DSP chip, how the Android passes things into this, re-implement algorithms ourselves, and let's claw back that 100 milliseconds. You know, let's go ahead and get our echo canceled voice communication over the network down under 100 milliseconds. Let's aim for 50 milliseconds. Let's not settle at, you know, 450 or even 250. Let's be better than anything that anybody has ever seen. And that's that type of nuts and bolts level thing that we can put a couple people on that are really good at nailing that down and we can make an improvement that's going to affect everything, our existing products. Let's take that, let's make Workrooms Horizon, uh, social home, all of these things just much better directly. So unlike products, architectures and technologies, you know, SDKs and toolkits, they can always claim victory and just say, we made a wonderful architecture. Uh, nobody used it correctly. Nobody picked it up. Um, the applications didn't take advantage of it in the right way. And it is so easy to let yourself off the hook like that. So I, um, you know, you've got to actually be using the things to make value from it. You know, I worry about this in a lot of ways with our advanced technologies, where we, you know, we're happy when interesting little proof of concept things come out, but if it's not showing up kind of on the big board as like, okay, hundreds of thousands of people are using this, it's, you know, it's delivering millions of hours of value. Maybe they actually aren't all of the, all that important, and maybe other things could have been more important to to focus on. So um, Horizon, Horizon has some strong points. Um, you know, I do enjoy being in that talking to people. I think the social conversation, uh, I've said, I, it feels like we've got line of sight on that sort of co-presence social um, aspect when everybody's holding their controllers right, nothing's looking goofy, you're looking at each other. The conversation works pretty well. When you get reduced latency from the, the audio, it makes it more and more lifelike. And there's some good things there, but still, you know, it's a far cry from the metaverse, you know, of our visions and what we'd like to see. Um, you know, like the Q&A session that I'm doing after this talk, we're going to have 16 audience members in there. That's a far cry from just even the, the hallway talks. Like when I would be physically at Connect, there would often be 50, 60 people kind of in a crowd around me in the, uh, just in the hallway where we're talking about, you know, whatever anybody wants. And last year we had a little bit of the random entry whereas whoever kind of hopped through the portal first got into the, the Q&A session. So I'm a little disappointed we're almost backing away from the virtual session here. But really what we want to have is something that feels like that session, you know, like the, the real connect where thousands of people are here milling around. Uh, some of them cluster around me outside. We all crowd into a room for the big keynotes. And you get all of that ability without having to have people fly across the country or across the world to get there. You know, that's that's what we've always been pitching as the value of VR. So, um, you know, I really do want us to pitch kind of connect as the North Star event of what we're doing. Uh, we've got an event that we do every year here. We've got a user base for this. Uh, we should be doing this in the metaverse. If we can't handle this, we can't handle sort of the vision. And we could do this by next year. I mean, I thought we could have done it by this year if we had really kind of made this a frontline focus, but we didn't have that focus like, like we do now a year ago. But I'll be really disappointed if I'm sitting here next year in front of a video crew and a camera in physical reality doing this talk. I want to be walking around the halls or walking around the stage as my avatar in front of thousands of people getting the feed across multiple platforms. I, I mean, I'm laying that down, laying that gauntlet down right now. We should be able to do that. This should be exactly in line with what our stated mission is. So we should make this happen to make sure that we're doing something that's valuable to at least us. And then it will very likely be valuable to a lot of other places. So the problems with that, with I am capacity planning, where if you're in Horizon now and you've got 16 people in there, they're already popping down to low fidelity avatars, getting pointy elbows and uh, kind of jittery updates as the system tries to kind of manage all of that. And that's just 
16 people, maybe 20 total when you've got cameras and other things going on there. It's not that much. How do we get to something that looks like this? I am, you know, a small, even a large meeting. You know, it's, it's a problem. In workrooms, we can't have our VR leads meeting because there's too many people on the call. We can't all fit into workrooms. How do we get that scaled out? How do we scale to the point where even a small club concert, these become uh, you know, really challenging things. There's no way that you can just spawn 80 entities in Unity like this with our Horizon avatars and expect to have it work. So the, the magic that is being reached for in many cases is that, well, cloud rendering would let us use much more powerful systems than, uh, than the current headset systems, and we could add a bunch more on there. And like I said earlier, I'm very supportive of cloud rendering architectures, but I have to pull back a little bit and say that, well, you know, there's going to be a lot of costs there. That would cut off a lot of people that don't have the bandwidth to be able to have that high quality of a connection. I am, you know, it does have some, uh, some negatives on the quality when you're dealing with the cloud connections versus local rendering. Uh, and the step after that, what I had suggested well before we really spun up this metaverse stuff is that we should do a horizon in the cloud as a separate technology development uh, project where we can certainly run it as a cloud application now, just compile the PC version and run it globally. And that's the most flexible way to do things, but it runs into some of these uh, you know, quality challenges there. Now, there's a ton of other things that you can do with sort of hybrid applications where you want to say, like your local hands or controllers and your local UIs, you could make an application where all of that is done locally on your headset and only the crowd of other people is done with cloud rendering and kind of pulled into it. Um, and I think that there's talk about wanting to make that sort of a general purpose uh, application interface. And I don't think that's going to work. Uh, I don't think many applications are interested in refactoring the, the way they do things. It's not a trivial thing. Just run your app in the cloud is pretty trivial. You bite off a whole lot of downsides, but it just works. Splitting your application up into locally rendered things and compositing with cloud fragments, that's the type of thing that I think is application specific. And rather than spinning out some general technology SDK. We should just try to take Horizon and work all of that out. Maybe we find out there are some great uh, kind of ways to slice it that are maybe more general purpose, but I'm concerned that it would be pretty specialized, And but it could still be sort of what we want to do for, for cloud rendering, um, or for Horizon at least. Now this actually goes back to like the wheel of technology just kind of reincarnating over and over again, way back in, Hex, probably the late 80s, uh, there was a, a windowing system called News that let you write certain UI things to be executed on your local system that might be connected by a very low bandwidth connection or a modem link or something to a larger system that's doing the rest of the rendering. And people had a hard time with that then, and I think it's very much the same thing, and people will continue to have a hard time with it. But sometimes if you've got to solve a problem, it's the, the thing to do. But even with cloud rendering there, um, it's not a panacea where the uh, PCs are fast, they're 10 times faster than what we have on our mobile headsets, but there's already a dozen metaverse wannabe VR applications running on the PC using all of the power of the PC, and none of them are magic and are making everything amazingly work. And even with the power of the PC, you can't scale up both avatar count and avatar quality at the same time. We can't talk about codec avatars and crowds of people. You know, they just don't work right together. And even worse, the economics of this get really bad. We can't just take... Uh, you know, the very latest 3090 GPU and run all of those in cloud instances for everyone, that's just fundamentally expensive, even before you account for sort of the NVIDIA data center tax of running things there. Uh, and in fact, NVIDIA is building all these technologies to let you fragment up uh, cloud GPUs into smaller pieces so you can give less power to individual cloud instances. And that's useful for some things, but we might wind up with cloud instances that are only two times as powerful as our mobile system. And then you run encoding and all the other things on there and the other downsides, and it might wind up being almost a wash or not such a great idea. Perhaps the biggest saving grace for it would be that cloud rendering lets us then sort of project the metaverse onto any device really trivially. Anything that could accept a video stream could go ahead and have full featured interface there. Easy to port, easy to bring up, lots of, you know, lots of benefits there. But still, if someone had asked me in the year 2000, like 
I'm working on Doom 3 at the time, and they said, could you build the metaverse if you had 100 times the processing power that you've got on your system today? And that's about where we are. Like our modern mobile systems are about 100 times as powerful as a lot of PCs of that era. And I would have said yes, it would have been a serious optimization challenge. There's all these things that you might have had to do to make it work out well. But, you know, if I had to make the metaverse work just on our mobile hardware today, I think it could. I'm, you know, it would take, it would be an optimization challenge, which is sort of the problem where everybody that wants to work on the metaverse talks about the limitless possibilities of it. But uh, it's not limitless. It is a challenge to fit things in, but you can make, smarter decisions about exactly what is important and then really optimizing the heck out of things like that. I am, but that's different than just saying, I want magic technology to fix all of this. I want to be able to have my designers not care what's going on. They should just be able to do amazing, cool stuff. And that's not really, you know, where we are. So, uh, and then to be even more contrarian here, uh, I have to say, it's like, are we necessarily even aiming for all the right targets with the social metaverse, where the feeling of co-presence is the big bet, and that is, it's completely understandable why, you know, a company like Facebook or Meta would, you know, would make that play. It's what's, you know, it's what the company is built on. But, you know, in truth, a lot of the luxury items in reality are freedom from co-presence. You know, it's a private office, a private beach, a private plane. You know, sometimes these things are just add people is not always a positive, especially for people that are a little more on the introverted side of things. And there's also this notion that building all of these 3D things, 3D art, 3D objects, that these are the critical factor that people are going to love so much in the metaverse. And I do keep coming back to this point that I've made a few times that I am almost all of the value of the stuff that we've built in our culture today is represented on flat screens. You know, there's trillions of dollars of all the software and media and assets and things that, that are built around flat screens. And I've made the pitch before that perhaps a sufficient um, argument for VR is to just say it's screens and people as the primary thing, where you've got that ability to have your friends together in a small room, and you've got the ability to bring up all of the things that you do on your other devices in VR in more flexible screens. And then the VR-specific things, I, you know, the actual games, the Beat Sabers and things, that those may be sort of the interstitial things that complement rather than define the medium. And I made a, you know, an extension of that where for the metaverse, maybe the metaverse is just lots of screens and lots of people, that maybe there is a screen-focused world where everything that people do with photography and videography and all of that just has this amazing place in a virtual world where you've got the flexibility to have those presented all over the place, where everybody can do magical things with video today and photos, where not everybody can do that many magical things with 3D modeling and 3D art. Some can, but it's a tiny fraction of the people. Maybe it extends like video has and it gets democratized so that everybody gets to, to take part in that. But also, maybe that takes a while. So I kind of keep pushing on, it's like, let's make sure that we get all of our screens right, that we get the ability to, to handle everything, all the types of apps, all the types of cloud services, that everything that anybody does on a piece of glass today, you should be able to do in the metaverse, hopefully more flexibly and better in various ways than you can on the existing devices. Because I want our VR headsets to subsume and replace other devices. I don't want it to be the thing that you have in addition to your TVs and consoles and computers and laptops and all of these things. It needs to take the place of at least one and hopefully more things. That's been so much of the value that mobile phones have brought into the world where they replaced a whole pile of things and brought you know, all their new value in addition to that. But it's this kind of subsuming the other things that I think is, you know, is really a core part of the value. Now, everybody agrees that a closed platform doesn't deserve to be called the metaverse, but there's a spectrum where you can have completely open Wild West sorts of things, and then you can have completely locked down single application platforms. And it's, you know, it's a pretty good bet that we're not going to be all the way over on the Wild West side of things. Um, you know, I'm certainly partial to that direction, but a lot of the, the strenuous advocates for that, I'm 
It has to be accepted that centralized systems provide most of the value in the world today, and there's reasons for that other than just accidents of history. It is easier to make better, more valuable experiences in many ways with a centralized system. I mean, all the issues with federation and standardization, there's good value that comes out of all of that, but it comes at a cost, and you can't really just ignore it. I am. You know, and like on the commerce side of things, everybody agrees you have to be able to make a living in the metaverse. Commerce is going to be some part of it. But I, I usually have like, I use adult entertainment as a litmus test for how open a platform is there. I, you know, if there's adult entertainment, it's a very, very open platform from a commerce standpoint. Uh, we probably won't be there. You know, I halfway jokingly suggest certain things along those lines occasionally, but I, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to be in the completely open crypto world of things. I, you know, the libertarian in me loves the idea of unstoppable global cash transactions, but you know, I'm also well aware of the kind of swamp of scams and the spam that I have to clear out of my timeline every morning dealing with that side of things. So I've actually got a bet that I'm kind of sorting out with somebody about the relative adoption of federated versus closed systems over the next 18 months. And it's going to be interesting how things play out because I can envision worlds where it goes either way and we really don't know at this point. So we're still kind of figuring a lot of these things out. Now, the most obvious path to the metaverse is that you have one single universal app, something like Roblox, where if you've got a Turing complete extension language and you've got sufficient interfaces, in theory, you can do anything inside any app. I mean, we're all running all of our apps inside the operating system and it just kind of defines however many turtles you stack on top of things. I kind of opens up the levels of abstraction there. But I'm, you know, it's, it's probably, I doubt a single application will get to that, that level of taking over everything. Uh, the problem is that if you make a bad decision at the central level, nobody can fix it. You know, you can, you can kind of cut off entire swaths of possibility, things that might be super important. And I just don't believe that one player, you know, one company winds up making all the right decisions for this. So the next step down would be to have, you know, our metaverse be something like a giant Unity plugin so that anybody could build an app with this massive base layer of functionality. And that's sort of where we are today, where we have um, Horizon Worlds, Horizon Workrooms, Horizon Venues that are all Unity applications built using many of the same technologies, but it's far from a clean integration right now. It's huge issues where Workplace goes and does all this great work. It doesn't flow back into Horizon. It's a mess right now, but we could imagine that getting straightened out to the point where you drop in this huge block of code on top of things and you've got this baseline functionality. So it's kind of like I'm, I remember asking my younger son why he was enjoying kind of playing with Minecraft mods a little more than Roblox mods because Minecraft had all of this stuff already there while more things had to be built from scratch in Roblox. So there's interesting aspects there. And then the, the lowest level would be just kind of sharing avatars, profiles, friend graphs, things like that. Kind of like we do is just cleaning up the APIs that we already offer to places. And it is great when you get, I mean, I love VR applications where I've got friend scoreboards and I can see profile pictures from them there and it's easier to kind of invite your friends to things. And those are all good things, but you know, it's really not the metaverse. But on the other side of that, where while Horizon Worlds uh, workrooms and venues are all Unity apps, Horizon Home is really a rebranding of VR Shell, where it's a C++ application, so we have to interact with all of these things to get the avatars and the profiles and all of these things that happen in the Unity world happening in our C++ world, and we're still spinning that up and there's a bunch of challenges for it. So um, there's some styling of the upcoming hardware as being kind of metaverse oriented. And I really don't like that, and I keep pushing back wherever I hear some of these things where it's important to say that all of these future of work and metaverse things, all of them will work just fine on Quest 2, where the upcoming high-end hardware will add some of these features like facial tracking and more world understanding that might add some things on top of these, but they are not central to the experience. And it is going to be significantly more expensive. So it's going to be uh, you know, really interesting to see the relative adoption of this. Now, hardware development takes a long time, and I'm, 
We have multiple new headsets in the pipeline, and this is the first year in a while that we haven't announced a headset at, uh, at Connect. Uh, part of that really is an artifact of, again, truly heroic effort to actually get Quest 2 shipped last year. But it's still true that there's only so many points that we can test. The solution space for hardware is large. You can say more or less of a whole, whole slew of different things, and you can say binary features of have or have not on lots of other things. Um, so we get to make kind of one bet a year about this, and that is point sampling a complex high-dimensional function and hoping that we can pull a lot of good information out of it. You know, in the eventually the mature VR headset market should cover all the niches that mobile phones do, everything from $50 budget phones to $2,000 ultra luxury phones. Uh, but we only get to make a couple points. We used to, early on in Oculus, talk a lot about the possibility of kind of second or third party headsets that could interoperate with our ecosystem. And that turned out to be really challenging to do because uh, like Mark said, we sell our headsets, you know, at a loss or break even. Uh, there's no profit in the headset. So there's there's no way that uh, a company could go and say, I want to make a budget headset. I'm going to undercut uh, the prices here without wanting to be able to negotiate for a cut of the ecosystem revenue. You know, that's just kind of the way those things work. And on the high end, while we could imagine somebody going and saying, well, I'm going to make a very expensive headset, most of the interesting features that we talk about, things like eye and face tracking and world tracking, these are things that require deep core system software integration to really make them valuable. And so we can't work that closely with another company dealing with that. It's just really, really challenging. There's still a couple spots where it might work. If a company made a super wide FOV headset or a super high resolution headset that was still basically the same thing, it's still exactly the same sensors um, or exactly the same modalities that we have in Quest 2, maybe something like that could work, but there's nothing like that kind of really going on right now. So um, cost is really critical. I, I always worry about kind of disruptive innovation where so much of the time the things that come out uh, come out as being cheaper than the things where people were focusing on quality. And I worry a lot that we have people in research uh, and product that have access to the best things that we could possibly build. And, you know, they then look at that and say, well, we should be building the best thing we can build. Uh, not necessarily the most cost-effective thing. And it's easy for people to fall into the trap of saying, well, I've seen better, so this is garbage, even if millions of people are getting a lot of great value out of it. So I'm... And there's also lots of evidence from a lot of consumer devices about very nonlinear demand curves, where sometimes lowering the price by $50 or $100 can be way larger increases in uh, in the number of sales that you get than you know than you would think from just linearly looking at it. And we can't disentangle that so much with Quest 2 because again, Quest 2 was better, faster, and cheaper, and it went up very non-linearly. But I still suspect that the price point was uh, you know was pretty important. Um, there's but the other side of that is that we have people that we have demonstrated existence proof that there are people for which zero dollars is not cheap enough to make the current headsets valuable because there are plenty of Quest 2 headsets in closets now that are not being regularly used. We have lapsed VR users. Now, there are no lapsed mobile users, essentially. Everybody uses a mobile phone. They might switch to a different brand, but they never just give it up. But there are, right now, a whole lot of people that are lapsed VR users that just did not find the experience valuable enough for them to even take something out of their closet that they already own. So, obviously, more value needs to be delivered for us to get to the value point that a mobile phone has. Um, it's an open question how much of that comes from software versus hardware. Obviously, some has to come from both. But uh, like one of the test points that we're looking very closely at, a lot of consoles go through this cycle where you get lapsed users and they resurrect when hot new content comes out. So Resident Evil is one of our biggest tentpole releases, and we're looking very closely at this to see does that bring cause people to bring the headset out of the closet, play Resident Evil, and then check out what else is new and how much better the, the ecosystem has evolved. Um, but it is possible that we need 
higher end systems, that we need systems with features that, that we don't have now. Like some people really do believe that the facial tracking sensors, that ability to be able to smirk or smile or look sadly forlorn at something in VR is, uh, you know, will take it over like a significant milestone that there will be some bright line that we cross there where it gets that much better that the experience is worth that much more than it was before. You know, maybe the sensing your environment, letting you do more in the mixed reality side of things is critical. Lots of people, I am, you know, respectable positions to take, make that bet. But personally, I still think that the fundamental capabilities of Quest that we just extended in Quest 2 are a sufficient baseline. That if we could do another better, faster, cheaper of Quest 2, uh, that it would be fantastic and we would see another significant uptick just like we saw with this. So, uh, the untapped possibilities with that baseline and better software, you know, the normal improvements that you'll just always get, camera resolution will go up, RAM will go up, flash will go up, processor speeds will go up, or at least wider with more cores, we're going to get that anyways. Uh, it's the question about these binary new things. Do we need to go from four cameras to six, eight, 10, 12? I mean, there are headset designs that have been proposed with a straight face that have like a dozen cameras on them. And I think that's madness. I, you know, I think that you're never going to get down to this low end, potentially $50 budget phone thing with a dozen cameras. Software will let us get uh, improve things in a lot of ways while discrete physical components are going to have a real price floor on them. But I can be wrong. So we're running the experiment with a higher end headset coming up next. We will see how much value it adds to people. Uh, they were intentionally very vague with the tease about what's going to be there, but it's you can sense eye and facial sensors, uh, better world sensors, and then the pancake lenses. And the pancake lenses are, uh, they're much more expensive, but they are much more compact. Uh, you know, they're, you can make a headset that is a lot smaller, slimmer, uh, potentially better looking. And they are also potentially a lot clearer. Where one of the points that I've made is Quest 2 over most of its field of view is optics limited rather than resolution limited. You are more limited by our optics train when you're looking at things away from the very center of the screen than you are by the display. You know, if we doubled the display resolution, most of it would just be a waste right now. We need something that's going to add some additional clarity. So I'm hoping that that really works out, but that also might put a price floor on you know, future budget systems if we wind up adopting that for everything. Um, thermals drives so much of the design where I, oh, I'm running out of time fast on this. I am, you know, in so many ways, we are already limited by just the power that we can dissipate for things where, you know, our system that we've got in Quest One, if we're able to run that at maximum clocks for everything, it could do most of the things that Quest Two has. And if we could run Quest Two at full clocks for everything, you know, it would probably have more performance than whatever the next gen SOC is. And we are we are very conservative about what we're willing to do on thermals uh, at Oculus. I mean, everybody is justifiably concerned about you don't want to have sort of a battery fire or you don't want to have something cooking and smoking on someone's head. But I think in many cases, as, as I've seen over and over with like our displays and some of the other things, I think we're overly conservative where I keep saying, it's like, all right, you want to talk about we're going to damage something. I want somebody to blow something up in front of me. I want to see smoke coming out of this SOC before I will really agree that, uh, okay, there is a fundamental limit here. Uh, so many of the, and we went through all of this back with Gear VR, where so many of the limits that people pick for how hot can we run something are just numbers picked out of thin air. Uh, they are not something where there's a fundamental bright line here that we're going to cross. So we've got a ton of different optimizations and things that we can add a lot of value to our systems if we allow ourselves to. Um, there's the spectrum where you go from actively cooled systems like Quest and Quest 2, where we've got a fan on there and a big heat sink and it blows through it, to passively cooled systems like the Oculus Go, where you can have a lighter system that's quieter, um, and then you get to systems that you might want to wear all day long. You know, the, the notional future AR glasses, you want to have something that you pick up in the morning, pull off your nightstand, put on your head, and it's on your head for 16 hours and it's functioning like that. 
uh, that gets really, really hard as you're going from not only is it passively cooled, but a microscopically small battery relative to these large systems has to run it for that long of a time. And then you're hoping people are actually engaging with it, that it's not just a passive system. So the challenges of energy are really one of the primary things that we have to deal with. You know, there's, you know, controllers didn't get much uh, attention in anything being talked about today. I'm, you know, I historically, I completely own the fact that I underestimated the amazing value that we get in gaming from the six off controllers. But it's still clear that we are going to wind up in a world where you can eventually get, you know, a headset without controllers where you just use your hands. It's nascent now, it's got lots of room to improve, but eventually we'll get to something like that. Or maybe it uses the, the brain computer interfaces, uh, using more voice, I'm, um, you know, other camera sensors for watching your eyes, different things like that. But the point I made a long time ago is it's clear we're not going to be walking around the world with, you know, dual six off controllers and holsters on our hips. That's just not going to be the, the platform that gets out to a billion people. But they are marvelous for games. And there are all of these things that we can still improve the controllers. We can wind up, you know, letting them track themselves so they don't have to be viewed by the headset. We can let them be passively tracked so they can be cheaper. You know, we can wind up with things that allowing you to use your hands in place of controllers, even in the existing applications. But all of these are things that just take work. Um, and one of the designs that I'd like to see is I, I'd love to see an embrace of actual flexibility in the headsets. You know, our headsets are these big rigid things and I complain that we have to build these like Tonka toys with I, you know, big plastic toy shells around them where I'd love to see us go ahead and take something that was, you know, break up the modules into independent things so you can move them across, let it be bendable there so you've got any IPD and make them more like giant swim goggles uh, and track from there. We can improve the, you know, the field of view with canting it there, uh, solve all of the IPD and placement issues, let people get it really where they need to have it for the best sighting and, uh, and make a lot of progress. So, but still, I think we could add a lot more value with software improvements than with hardware, or at least with convenience, which may involve some hardware elements. One of the things that I revisited recently that in retrospect is even more striking, where we have these few data points, this half dozen different headsets that we've built, and when you kind of compare aspects of them, Gear VR to Oculus Go was a really interesting comparison where by the time Oculus Go shipped, Samsung phones already had faster processors and better screens than what we shipped on Go. And yet, Oculus Go had integer multiples better retention than what we were seeing on Gear VR. And it was all because docking your phone, taking it out of the, you know, your case and putting it into a headset was just an enormous pain. Once you got there, the quality of software was better than Go. But that friction of getting in there was again enormous integer multiples of difference in it in i uh, you know uh, in our retention you know we fight over small percentage digits and this is multiples so i tend to believe that we have advantages like that just to be gotten by making our current platform just magically awesome you just put it on everything is perfect you know right now you put on a quest 2 there's seems like sometimes a 50-50 chance you're going to have to redraw Guardian depending on what time you la of day you last used it. You have to tap through accepting a couple different things. You wait for home to load a whole bunch of panels. Then you finally launch something to go do it and it takes another 20-30 seconds or more to get into it. And I tell people, imagine if your phone was like that. Imagine you pulled your phone out of your pocket and it took you two minutes to get to do the thing that you wanted to do instead of two seconds there is an enormous value that we can tap into that to make it a lot better. So sort of related to that, the ultimate in inconvenience was we had the recent uh, Facebook outage, which left a lot of people with headsets that were very broken. And there is you know, no real apologizing for this. It was horrible uh, that that happened, but we had a really fantastic internal effort where there was a team of people that were going through cataloging everything that didn't work while that was going on. It's like the saying is never let a crisis go to waste. And uh, I thought about asking if I could publicly release this because it would have shown how much we really are trying to figure these things out and make it better. But uh, but it had too, it had far too much really internal stuff to, to just kind of dump that out. But I really thought that was a very positive thing with people looking at that. And it's a clear case of you can't 
you can't break people's stuff like that. We need to be delivering value, not kind of inhibiting it or taking it away. And the things that we're just starting to see, the kind of the advance of multitasking into our systems where you, know, you can have the multiple web browsers and we have the ability to pull up the different Android apps and the media apps and being able to arrange some of these. Like I was delighted the last time I was looking at something, I thought the keyboard was awkwardly far away and it's like, oh yeah, I can just grab that and move it up to where I want it to be now. That just worked magically well. We have cases where like, oh, I can just now upload a screenshot uh, directly to Twitter from browser. Uh, it just works now. Um, okay, now we can start doing copy and paste. Some of these things that you expect to be there, but you've kind of conditioned yourself, haven't been there in VR because the platform's too young, but they're starting to come in one at a time. And we are going to get to this place where it is a more flexible work environment than any single glass screen that you've got that you could do things on. And I... Uh, you know, we've got to do a bunch of serious work in there, figuring out desktop, all that management stuff. We need to get virtual memory working, like real swapped virtual memory. None of this, you know, do a little bit of compressed swap for there. We need to be able to have five applications that you've opened up, let one of them page out if necessary so things don't just crash and disappear as you work on something else. Uh, but we can get there. We have huge internal battles about the different things like we're, our plan of record here is we're, we're big on web apps, but I keep making this point, it's like the platforms that succeed wind up having native apps as well. We run Android apps now for some of our Oculus TV systems. I, we should be running all Android apps. You know, We should be able to pull in the long tail of applications where we have a few hundred applications in VR. Real platforms have millions of applications. You know, We are not going to bridge that by having people kind of bring them over one at a time, but we get you know, we, I have arguments with people about how, oh, we need to get people to add VR affordances to their applications. And the thinking is, well, maybe we can get the top 50 apps uh, to come over and put in like extra ways to explicitly look for scrolling events and different things like that. But I think it's actually our obligation and duty to figure out on our side, what can we do to make the VR platform take advantage of this, again, trillion plus dollars worth of content on all of the flat screens. We need to figure out how to take advantage of that rather than saying, oh, they need to change their applications to come to us. You know, we want to work on Android apps, cloud Windows desktops, remote desktop applications. I want to bring everything in so that everything can be done there. But on us, maybe that means, like, I would love it if we made a decision on next-gen controller, whatever we do to make it easier to act as a TV set or a laptop or anything like that. You know, it should be on us. So we actually have a, a ton of features that are sort of not well exposed right now. And there's a problem like for years, we've had all of these options in uh, like for video recording. We've got all of these ways that video comes out of our systems where streaming to the uh, to desktop PC browsers, streaming to the uh, FB Live, streaming to your phone with Twilight, recording it. And generally our defaults are like not so great. We've got all these options for changing the bit rate, changing the aspect ratio and resolutions. And you can get these through like our Oculus Developer Hub application if you're a developer, but I'm, you know, for conventional users, there's not really anything that, uh, that lets you get there. And I kind of wish that we had a, the equivalent of the old Quake console where you do some magic cord and you get like an old school text terminal and you could just type in different things to like turn features on and off because when we make an official feature, it's got to go through our design department. It's got to be internationalized for all of this. And the way things are set up, that has to be going through separate processes usually for running the panel display to communicating with what's actually done. And it is such an enormous tax on what we can actually accomplish. And we need to find ways to go faster with that. But I'm, you know, there's there's a lot of value that should just come with a simple little toggle. I had I, something I did recently where I saw someone make internally make a, uh, they had a big post about how to capture stereoscopic video from, uh, from inside VR. And I was like, well, how did they do that? We don't actually save that out. And I was horrified to find that they actually did a full ADB record of the distorted two eye view and then undistorted that to make a, uh, 
you know, to make a stereo video, which we could then play back. And I'm like, oh my God, that's, that's just horrible. That's, I, that's not the way you should do something. But they cared enough to do that. And they knew that getting it through our full system design process, that it just wasn't really going to happen. It wasn't going to rise to the top. But that was the type of thing like, no, that's actually not that hard. I, I took an afternoon and it just took a few hours for me to go in and put the, the real way to do that. But it's controlled by a system pref that you have to set over ADB right now, where I'd love to get that in an advanced settings option on all the record things. Uh, but you know, that's just, that's gonna be a thing that'll take six months for us to wind up getting something like that done. So we need to figure out how to move faster on so many of those things. We have more than enough people in the VR organization working on uh, all of these features, but we trip over our own feet in so many ways. And I am totally running out of time here. You know, I think I'm going to try to do something uh, that I've never done before here, where I'm gonna take these notes that I've got that I'm kind of scanning through here that I'm only maybe two thirds of the way through, and I'm just gonna dump them up on, uh, on a Facebook post and send a link to it. This will be an interesting insight into how I wind up doing these things. Um, because yeah, I've got a bunch more talking about the system software, stuff talking about developer things, and then a few miscellaneous things coming in on the end, and maybe these turn into topics that I am, you know, that we can explore in some other ways. But I did want to close with just I uh, one funny little uh, anecdote where I play a lot of Beat Saber, and sometimes I actually put on arm weights. And I know that's not recommended for a lot of people. You can strain your elbows and so on, but I worked up to it. It's part of my exercise regimen. Uh, but there was a time this year where I was playing Beat Saber, I had my arm weights on. I tell people, don't hit me with E plus and Camellia songs when I'm playing with my arm weights, but sometimes people still do, and it's, it's pretty rough. But in one of those sessions, I got a phone call that I had to take, and I had to just like jump out of VR, and everybody else in the room was like, John's little avatar just fell over and stopped moving. Did we give him a heart attack playing those songs in Beat Saber? And I had to like come back uh, after I was finally done on Twitter. It's like, no, I'm actually okay. People were pinging me. It's like, did you have a heart attack? Are you all right? But uh, yeah, I have a grand time in VR. I am proud of the work that we do, and I'm still very excited about the future. So I'll see a bunch of you in a half hour at the Q&A session. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, John.